Okay, I am live now. I had a meeting, uh, kind of the Monday morning meetings uh, about about history stuff and all that. Now I got to meet with the other American history teachers and hope you had a good weekend. It was nice outside. I was hoping to be sunnier today. I'm just checking the window. And all right. So I am just setting up my little thing to make sure that the monitor is working. Sorry, I had to reboot my iPad. But it seems to be coming up now. All right, good. So I'm up, and this is one of the most important lectures I'm going to do then. This will lay out the facts behind the DBQ. I'll go quickly over some of the events of the 19, of 1944 and 45 in the Pacific. We'll watch a little bit of a video clip. But... This is a really important one for you to watch. This will lay out the facts of, about the, the reason why the United States dropped the atomic bomb. And so you, so these are the crucial elements. Also, I gave a very short reading. If you look at it, it's a PDF and it looks like a lot of pages, but then you'll notice the way they formatted it, it's really small. It's actually just short little paragraphs. Uh, I, I just can't get it to transfer to a regular file without uh, messing up the formatting so much. I just keep using the PDF. But it talks about the issues behind the reason they dropped the atomic bomb. And it is the best short, uh, the best um, short document I have found, at least relatively short, that gives you all the information about from Pearl Harbor, treatment of POWs, um, how difficult the island fighting, but one of the most important key element there is the Russians, the Soviets. Can't emphasize that enough. So let's go ahead and get to this. As you can see in this picture right here, uh, this ash the one I'm showing you on the screen right now, that is from Iwo Jima. And the volcanic ash with Mount Suribachi in the background, unbelievably difficult fighting, which we'll get to in just a second. Obviously, I can't go over every island, but remember yesterday, when, or yesterday, Friday when I talked about D-Day, Every invasion of an island was a D-Day, the Day-Day. And so we have a, a hundred D-Days in the Pacific, some tiny little ones, relatively minor operations, some massive like Saipan or Iwo Jima or of course Okinawa. So let's get to the Pacific campaign. The Pacific campaign, remember I mentioned before about island hopping and leapfrogging. The idea was to avoid strongly held enemy defenses. And I mentioned this on Friday, Admiral Nimitz in the Central Pacific and General MacArthur in the, in the Southern Pacific from Guadalcanal moving up the Solomons. He was leapfrogging here, island hopping. And after 43, the realization hit that the Japanese were not as strong as they thought and they could avoid strongly held bridge, uh, bases like one of the most famous would be at Rabaul or Truk. Avoid those and attack islands for to make a base for the next island to attack. And that was a Japanese plan to hold out. But the Marianas Islands right here, Guam was an American colony, remember the Treaty of Paris way back in 1898. The United States got that from Spain, but also Tinian and Saipan and those islands were perfect for bomber bases. Huge for bases for brand new bombers called B-29s to bomb Japan. And so, here is the leapfrogging in the Pacific, getting closer to the Philippines, and the Marianas is right here. And so, first off, before we, right when the invasion began, the Japanese sent the last elements of their fleet, which had been devastated by Midway and in the battles around Guadalcanal, to with, combine with, with uh, land-based air in the Marianas to try to attack the American fleet. And this would be known as the Battle of the Philippine Sea. And even though the United States did not get a decisive victory sinking Japanese carriers, there's a Japanese carrier right there under attack. Japanese planes attacked American aircraft carriers and by the combination of new modern American planes and radar and better trained pilots, because the United States had more fuel to train more pilots, they completely destroyed the Japanese Naval Air Force. I mean, devastated. They called it the Marianas Turkey Shoot because these brand new fighters called Hellcats just devastated the Japanese naval aviation. And the Japanese will never be able to have any other, any kind 
uh, attack by aircraft, aircraft carriers get in the war. They're going to have a few that survive, but with virtually no planes. So Guam, Saipan, and Tinian, hellacious fighting. The Japanese fought to the very death. Remember Bushido, they would not surrender. They held every position. And here are Marines and soldiers. These are Marines right here. These are Army, Army Marine operation. Here's, this is uh, Saipan right here. And here are a couple just horrific shots. Here are Marines fighting a Japanese bunker and they have to use flamethrowers and high explosives called satchel charges to try to drive them out bunker by bunker. Because the Japanese plan was to take as many American casualties that the Americans would want a negotiated peace. But the Japanese had told the civilians on Saipan, the Japanese have had Saipan since World War I. Saipan and Tinian were Japan, or German colonies before World War I. They told the civilians that the Americans were going to murder them, eat their children, enslave them. They laid out this whole idea about how awful the Americans would be, and a lot of citizens of Saipan believed them. And here you can see, oops, there's a, Saip, uh, a civilian. Thousands of Saipan, uh, civilians in Saipan, but also in Tinian, jumped to their death and killed themselves rather than being taken by Americans. And this horrified Americans, but also gave them great pause. What would it be like if we have to invade Japan? And then they did these massive human wave, char wave charges on all three islands when it was clear that they were going to lose. But this was one glorious sacrifice the Americans quickly dubbed them bonsai charges because the Japanese were your know, bonsai. I mentioned this before, but this is on Guam. And look at all the bodies of men that were mowed down by Army and Marine machine gunners and artillery. And there were futile attacks to sacrifice themselves. And very few Japanese actually surrendered. Once again, remember, the United States is committed to unconditional surrender. How do you defeat an enemy that does this when it was clear that it's over? But we're not going to watch this video clip. I just had it set up just in case. But eventually, with these island bases right there, the bombing was able, they were starting to bomb Japan. They would soon start bombing in the fall and winter of 1944. They tried originally to bomb for China, and that was a complete disaster. So the Marianas, remember to take that strategic warfare, daylight precision bombing to Japan. And so once this happened, the decision was made, now they have to attack here. And remember, the Japanese started World War II in the Pacific to get the Dutch East Indies to have tankers bring oil to Japan. And so the thought was, we got to knock that out. Now, American submarines were already knocking them out. But the next attack was well, either Formosa, which is Taiwan, or the Philippines. General MacArthur, who had to leave the Philippines back in 42, convinced FDR to go to the Philippines. And so in 44-45, the United States Army and Marines and Navy attacked the Philippines. And this would be a long, brutal campaign because the Philippines are, well, there's over a thousand islands in this archipelago. They're mountainous, jungles. The Japanese would fight um, cave by cave, bunker by bunker. Remember, the goal is to take as many Americans as possible. Here are Marines and, well, actually, these are Army, landing on the island called Leyte. And here is General MacArthur landing on Leyte, making a big show of it for propaganda. I have returned. Uh, he is kind of full of crap. But... Here is Luzon, here's Leyte. I know I just put maps up there. We're not gonna go into detail about this. But the Japanese, the remnants of their fleets, they still had powerful surface ships like battleships. They tried one last effort. They thought they could knock out the American transport fleet. Remember, the goal is take so many American deaths, make it so awful that the Americans will negotiate a peace. And this will be one of the biggest naval battles in history, the Battle of Leyte Gulf. And the Americans were fooled. And I, I don't have time to go into detail, but mighty Japanese battleships, including the two biggest battleships in the world, the Yamoto right there had 18-inch 
diameter barrels on their guns, almost 70,000 tons. As it turned out, uh, um, ships that big had no real purpose because they could not hide and one of them would be sunk by airplanes. They nearly, right here, were right here off Leyte, they nearly caught the American transport fleet and could have inflicted horrific damage, but the Japanese commander there lost their nerve and they turned back. And one naval battle right here would be a huge American victory where American battleships destroyed a smaller Japanese fleet. And the only reason I'm mentioning that are most of the battleships there, the American battleships, were either sunk or damaged at Pearl Harbor. They brought them up to use to bombard Japanese islands and they finished off the remnants of the Japanese fleet. This almost victory. And here is a Japanese carrier. They're kind of decoys to avoid American attack. Here are American battleships. But on the Philippines, bloody, I, um, bloody fighting. Leyte took three months to take. They attacked the main island Luzon. The Japanese held Manila. These pictures on the bottom are Manila, and Manila would have to be destroyed. As building by building, basement by basement, the Japanese had to be rooted out. The fighting would not end on the Philippines, or the Philippines, um, there's still Japanese fighting on the Philippines when the Japanese surrendered in September of 1945. So a year they're fighting on the Philippines. And the last Japanese soldiers to surrender on the Philippines, they didn't surrender till the 1970s. They refused to surrender because of Bushido and thought the war was still going on. Well, now the Americans decided, now they're getting closer to Japan. And the decision was made to attack, now literally called the home islands of Japan. A little volcanic island called Iwo Jima, and then a major island called Okinawa getting closer to Japan. Remember, the goal of the United States is to get to Japan to unconditionally surrender. And their hope is they can do it without invasion of Japan, especially seeing how difficult it was to defeat the Japanese on other islands. And I've skipped a lot. I'm just giving you elements of it. Where are we at here? Okay. So Iwo Jima in February 45. So just as American troops and or British and Canadian, are just about ready to attack to the Rhine River, waiting for winter, winter Dan, and the Russians are 50 miles from Berlin. Iwo Jima would be attacked. And this tiny island, but it was flat and had three, well, two airfields, and they're building a third one on this airfield. They knew there were over 21,000 Japanese defending on it. They bombarded it from the sea and from the air for seven days. Yeah, these volcanic, this volcanic island, it was still an active volcano. You can see it right here. It's actually a pretty amazing island. So if you look at this, it got relatively flat, rugged though. With, they dug caves into the volcanic fissures and the volcanic ash that made up the island was still hot. But right here is Mount Suribachi and you can see Marines on landing craft going towards it. And great colorized picture, really well done there. The thought was after seven days, they should be able to cut across the island, and yes, the casualties would be horrific, but they should be able to take it in a few days. Well, as you can see from that, it's gonna take over eight days to take this horrible little island. And 21,000 Japanese soldiers would have to be killed to take this island. Only a few hundred surrendered, and most of them were wounded. The Japanese literally had to be killed one by one. And over 7,000 Marine and Navy and Coast Guardmen died taking this island. It was a bloodbath, an absolute bloodbath. Iwo Jima was a thing of nightmares. And think about this for a second. Germany is near surrender. Japan is militarily defeated. Their Navy is gone. They cannot win. And yet they continue to fight like this. One of the strange phenomenons we'll see, and I mentioned this on Friday, Wars sometimes, in fact, almost always get more bloody and more awful near the end as one side is desperately holding out and the other side is trying to get them to quit. Anything to quit by making it horrible. And so you have this awful war of attrition. So on Iwo Jima, those are Marines huddled in the volcanic ash. There are more Marines huddled 
I guess it was just hot. They would, still, they would start digging in and fissures would form and ashes thick and heavy and hard to dig into. There's in a Marine tank, you can see Suribachi where Japanese guns could train right down upon them. So much of the attack would be to take this uh, massive atoll or a massive uh, mountain and literally through bunker by bunker, small one-man little bunkers or little holes, they called spider holes, piece by piece, they had to go take them out. And eventually Mount Suribachi would take it. That's what it looks like. That's, this is a couple years ago. And you can see looking up at it. And that's where you get this famous scene with a second flag that was put up on top of Mount Suribachi. They put up a first flag, and that's the cover of my, or uh, for this video. The first flag was relatively small, so they ran up a bigger flag. And a time-life photographer just happened to get this picture of these men putting up the flag, these four men putting it up, just as, or just in that moment where they're reaching for it to put them in. And that would become one of the symbols of the Marine Corps. The Marine Memorial in near Arlington is that, one of the more famous pictures in American history. And to the Marines fighting in the, uh, underneath the mountain, they just let off a massive cheer, yet still there would be another nearly week of awful fighting on Iwo Jima. It's hard to wrap your mind around 7,000 men Americans and 21,000 Japanese dying for this tiny little island that's smaller than Helena. And then just two months afterwards, and maybe the overall biggest amphibious operation in history, Okinawa. Okinawa was a big island, heavily populated. And even though the, uh, the islanders on Okinawa are relatively mistreated by the Japanese, they have been under Japanese control for a long time and saw themselves as Japanese and they were told that the Americans would treat them with great brutality. And here are American, these are Navy Corsair fighters. That's what they called Antrap, this amphibious vehicle. We'd see a battleship shelling in the background. And Okinawa was a big island. And so you're gonna have two Marine divisions and two Army divisions. So it's a big operation. And the Marines advanced this way, and there were virtually no Japanese on, on two-thirds of the island. It took them totally by surprise. But the Army found a massive um, number of Marines. And in Okinawa, the fighting would be fierce. Here are, here's a Marine machine gunner. Uh, <laughs> these, <laughs> these Thompson machine guns actually jammed a lot, so not a very good weapon here. Here are Marine tanks. A couple of them are flamethrower tanks that could shoot jelly gasoline over 200 meters. And here are flamethrowers going by bunker by bunker. Bit by bit, they had to root out the Japanese. Okinawa would be horrific fighting. There are over 130,000 Japanese soldiers defending it and hundreds of thousands of civilians who were all absolutely convinced, brainwashed to believe that the United States would murder them all. So we're gonna watch just a little bit of World War II in color. Easter Hopefully Sunday, this won't be a censor. April 1st, April Fool's Day. The battle for the Japanese island of Okinawa. The terror of previous Pacific battles, Guam, Saipan, Iwo Jima, was still in the minds of U.S. Marines as the invasion began. Eugene Sledge was from Alabama. I wrote a great book called With the Old Breed. This time there was no promise of a short operation. A lieutenant said, this is expected to be the costliest amphibious campaign of the war. We're hitting an island about 300 miles from the Japs' home islands, so you can expect them to fight with more determination than ever. We can expect 80 to 85 percent casualties on the beach. The buddy next to me leaned over and whispered, How's that for boosting troops' morale? I only groaned. This is Sledge's fourth island. He had gone to hell. 50,000 men landed on the beach, but it was anticlimactic. To the Marines' astonishment, there was virtually no opposition. The release of tension was unforgettable. No need to crouch low to avoid the deadly shrapnel and bullets. 
It suddenly dawned on me, though, that it wasn't at all like the Japanese to let us walk ashore unopposed. It made the April Fool's Day aspect even more sinister, because all those thousands of first-rate Japanese troops had to be somewhere, spoiling for a fight. Look how big that invasion fleet is. Gives you an idea of the power of the United States at that time. During the five days following the landings, U.S. troops cleared the northern part of Okinawa. Those were Marines. 120,000 Japanese troops were nowhere to be found. And the Marines just thought the then, army wasn't Against tough. the offshore fleet, oh. Japan unleashed its special attack force. Kamikazes. So, this is the first major use of kamikazes by the Japanese. They had tried it in the Philippines a couple different times and a little bit off Iwo Jima. But Okinawa was close enough to Japan that they used suicide bombers. Now, think about the logic of suicide bombers. Yes, it's absolute desperation. But remember their goal to force the Japanese to quit. Or, I'm sorry, to force the Americans to quit to force the Americans to quit. And if they force the Americans to quit by showing that they're willing to give up their lives to take as many Americans as possible, maybe the United States will negotiate a peace agreement. So yes, this is an act of desperation, but they knew it was designed to bring absolute terror to the United States. And it's relatively cheap because, oh, what a horrible way to say it, but it's relatively cheap. Japanese, they only have to train a little bit to take off and steer the plane. The hardest part about flying, anybody who has flown, it's landing for obvious reasons. So you can save your limited fuel because they could build planes, but they couldn't train pilots. And they knew this would terrify the United States. And the United States would keep the actual impact of kamikaze secret from the American public for years. So they did not use it till then. Nobody would ever use trained pilots and sacrifice them like this. Never. Never. So you hear people say, oh, they use kamikaze. No. Back to this and they do a good job. Normal planes, when they go through that kind, yeah, the Hancock got hit twice, and that's one of the more famous scenes. Almost 2,000 kamikaze suicide pilots flew to their deaths off Okinawa. Through that kind of fire, with that many planes being shot down, rational pilots would the turn back. The night before back. his suicide flight, 23-year-old Yasuo Ichijima wrote his final diary entry. I don't have any realistic sensation that I will die. No excitement, no sentiment. It is just like a dream when I imagine the final moment of my life. It is calm. It is quiet. I'm no longer living for myself. I am the manifestation of millions of Japanese prayers. I hope I'm worthy. Over 30 American ships were sunk by kamikaze attacks. 39. Almost 5,000 men were killed. The Japanese had lost their air and sea campaign, but the war continued. They tried to do the same exact thing with their fleet. They put just enough fuel on the remaining battleships and cruisers that survived Leyte Gulf, just enough fuel to get from the, the main islands to Okinawa with the idea of a massive sacrifice of the fleet. But American carrier planes caught them and sunk nearly all of them, killing over 12,000 Japanese sailors. That's a more lobbing shells up to the Japanese position. In May, the land battle for Okinawa intensified. The Japanese army had laid in wait at the southern end of the island, luring the U.S. forces to their strongest line of defense. And they had to worry about thousands of civilians there, too. Those are army. The Japanese were an unseen enemy, hiding in the thousands of caves across the island. One by one, they were flushed out. 
that's called a satchel charge, a high explosive charge to pull a chain. in his diary, and but japanese private seiki nomura wrote the enemy shelling finally stopped a brief moment of tranquility filled the cave but the next moment a big bang of hand grenades then another one suddenly a huge howl of explosion shook the cave the explosion blast blew in like the knocking of a devil from hell some soldiers crawled out from the cave all of us stood still without words we knew we were losing this war i know that sounds almost obvious but the japanese soldiers were told we're winning searches hold the out give your life for victory of okinawan civilians many dying of starvation the japanese military had taken all their food those who attempted to hide anything were executed and they're citizens of japan Japanese commanders had encouraged mass suicide. Hand grenades were given to civilians. Shigeaki Kinjo was 16 years old. The relatives had gathered together to die. We didn't know how to use the hand grenades. So we had to kill each other instead. The head of the village beat his wife and children to death. We knew we had to kill our beloved families. Some hit their wives and children over the head with stones or logs. Some cut their arteries with sickles. Some used ropes to bind their necks. I was so scared because I was still alive. By the end of June, Japanese resistance was over. Now, one thing I stopped it right there. You notice how they stripped the Japanese POWs naked because after Guadalcanal, there was a real fear that they would hide grenades or something on them. And this was the first island, and this is crucial. Large numbers of Japanese soldiers surrendered. Large numbers, over 30,000. And that was a big deal because we, there's a picture of the kamikaze and that was a big deal that japanese soldiers are surrendering maybe they're losing faith but anyways i mentioned this about the the uh the japanese uh kamikaze and this was an important consideration to the japanese negotiate a peace and this would be an honorable uh, uh, to negotiate a peace agreement would be an honorable peace so this is an act of total desperation, but the United States were committed to unconditional surrender. And so the point of view of many Americans, how do we convince them to unconditionally surrender when they are willing to sacrifice themselves with kamikazes? But don't forget, on Okinawa, 30,000 surrendered. That had never happened before. They even tried this weird kind of rocket kamikaze right here that would be carried by a, a, a medium Japanese bomber. It didn't work very well, but it was scary. And so, how do we get an uh, unconditional surrender when they fight with kamikazes? And the United States never really understood the Japanese goal. The Japanese goal takes so many American casualties that we negotiate peace. Many Americans are starting to think they're willing to sacrifice the entire country. The Japanese were not the same as Adolf Hitler. And so, with that, We're going to jump right to here. Here is... Here is the American Marine Cemetery. But we have D-Day May 8 while they're fighting on Okinawa. That Marine Cemetery is still there. Thousands of Americans would die on Okinawa. Sorry, I was having mouse issues. But... Remember, I already mentioned once before, VA did, VED was May 8th. The Japanese were still fighting. But a couple things we have to get to. At Yalta. Yalta in February 1945 was the second meeting of the Big Three. 
Roosevelt, Churchill, and FDR. They met in Yalta. The Yalta Peninsula, that is, I don't know why I put the picture so low. Yalta's in the Crimea, the Crimean Peninsula. And some unbelievably bitter fighting had happened there. It was a resort on the Black Sea, but the Crimea, first off, the, the Soviets held it, um, literally had to be rooted out inch by inch by the Germans and then vice versa. And so at Yalta, Stalin, who by then, I mean, he's the victor. He made that meeting be there because he wanted Roosevelt and Churchill to acknowledge what the Soviets had gone through. And don't forget, they had liberated, liberated much of the Balkans, half of Poland, but allowed the Polish home army to be destroyed. And remember, the war started in Poland, but they broke the back of the German army. The Red Army seems invincible. And so Churchill and Roosevelt arrived. And by the way, Stalin was a, a, a day late. The leader always makes others lesser people wait. Now, some people are just late. Did I say Roosevelt, Churchill, and FDR? Okay, that's better than having Hitler there. Let's start over. <laughs> Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin. <laughs> okay, at Tehran, I said Roosevelt, Churchill, and Hitler. So let's make sure we got this. Churchill, FDR, Stalin. I'm looking right at the picture in order from left to right. Churchill, FDR, and Roosevelt. Look at that picture of FDR. He looks quite old. Yes, he'd been elected for a fourth term, but he was becoming frail. What he had gone through since he had become paralyzed was obviously taking a toll. Obviously taking a toll. And so with that, a few things were decided. First off, now they're thinking post-war world. This is a different conference. Tehran was winning the war. Yalta, post-war. First off, Germany would be divided up into four occupation. I made a little typo there, so let me change that so I don't forget to do it. Why isn't this working? Uh-oh. It's supposed to say east, not east. I'm sorry. Germany would be divided into four occupation zones. Berlin would be divided uh, in four. Also Austria. I meant to put east. It came out east, and for some reason it won't let me switch. But, yeah, something's happened to the program. It's like it, it went loopy. But the four occupation zones, the big three, Britain, United States, and the Soviet Union would get an occupation zone. And then Britain and the United States demanded France would get one. So Berlin would be would get that too, but it would be in the Eastern occupation zone, AKA the Soviet occupation zone. So Berlin's going to be this weird island where it's going to have uh, from North to South, France, British, United States occupation zones in the middle of the overall Soviet occupation zone of Germany. Austria would be too, but Austria after the war would become a neutral country. So um, it didn't have the greatest impact as Germany, which would become the focal point of the Cold War. Next, where's my mouse? A United Nations, which had already been negotiated to replace the League of Nations, will be created. And remember Article 10 of the League of Nations about collective security. We should know about that. We had to do a DBQ about that. Well, the UN resolved this with what's called the Security Council. The Security Council would decide all the big issues, including sec collective security, and at first only 11. Now it's 15 uh, countries will be on it. And five permanent powers, each with a veto. The US, Britain, UK, France, the Soviet Union, and China. The U.S. Wanted, a, wanted China as a counterweight to the Soviets and Japan and Asia, even though China was in the middle of a civil war and also half occupied by Japan. Five countries, each with a veto. Each would have a veto. With the idea being no country would be forced to do anything in, um, like collective security unless they wanted to. And this is actually crucial because with those five countries, and it's still the same permanent five countries today, with a veto, 
nothing happens in the in the security council one of those countries will could veto something and therefore nothing controversial happens during the cold war it was always the u.s versus the soviet union but today it's a big issue all the way to today for example anything about the israeli occupation of places called the west bank and the golan heights which used to be part of jordan and syria anything about israel the united states will veto for example and so nothing happens in the u.n the u.n can do a lot of good things but but the security council written this way also i should add the u.n general assembly which actually has no real power the soviet unions I put down Russia, but the Soviet Union will get three uh, seats, which means they will get three representatives to kind of counterweight the U.S., Britain, and France. The Ukraine and Kazakhstan got one. And a lot of people complain, but this turned out to be not that big of a deal. The big one you need to know is the Security Council. That's the first part. But here are the occupation zones. And so Britain, France, U.S., Russia. And you also notice that it was decided here Poland would lose a big hunk of land, but they would get big parts of Germany, big parts. But that's the occupation line. But then a few more things. The Soviet Union agreed to enter the war in the Pacific. Three months after VE Day, they agreed that they would declare war on Japan and attack after Japan. and they were promised land and maybe something else afterwards. Uh, that's why I put, you know, eh, we'll see. But three months after, so VE Day was May 8th, 1945. So they pledged to attack on August 8th. Now going into uh, uh, in January of 45, the United States was still incredibly worried about how long it's gonna to take to defeat Japan. Japan, they thought, might have 2 million men in China alone. And the realization was that Japan might fight forever. We need Soviet help. But the only way to get the Soviets, promise a bunch of stuff. And that includes maybe occupation zones. And this is important because that's January going into February 45. By May, it was clear that Japan is much closer to, to defeat. The Germans have lost, and now, do we really want the Soviets there? It's an important to realize one thing. May 8th was VE Day. August 8th, then, is the date that the Soviets promised to attack. Do you want to guess the date of the first atomic bomb dropped on Japan? August 6th. It's no coincidence there was almost a desperate desire to end the war before the Soviets entered it. Next, and I put this in bold, the Soviets pledged free elections in Eastern Europe. They pledged it. We're going to have free elections. So there'll be free elections from Poland all the way down to Bulgaria. Free elections, democracy. And this was seen as a big victory at the time. So Stalin would not set up puppet dictatorships. Now, I should add, Roosevelt thought he had a big victory, even though Roosevelt by then was very frail and probably not as sharp as he normally was. Churchill didn't care, but he was worried that Stalin was lying. And Stalin was. Now, I should add, Stalin didn't see it as a lie. Stalin never in a million years was going to allow governments in, in Eastern Europe, governments on the Soviet border, allow governments there that would not be friendly to the Soviets. No way. He wanted a buffer zone. He was thinking that from day one. He needs a buffer zone. So when Stalin said free elections, Stalin said, hey, we're just making a show. Everybody knows I'm going to have friendly governments in here. No way is Germany going to do this again. So that's what he's thinking. But we already know, and they should have known, remember what he did about Warsaw. But still, what could the United States do? The Red Army, to say the Red Army was massive and powerful is an understatement. The Red Army had over 15 million men in Eastern Europe by then. And the Red Army beat the Soviets. Nobody wanted to mess with the Red Army. There would be war crime trials too. And they would turn out to be the Nuremberg trials. 
and they would lay out that there are certain elements of civilization that cannot be allowed and will be tried. And therefore, leading members of not only of the Nazi party in Germany and Austria, a little bit in Italy, but mostly Germany and Austria, and then Japan, they would be tried and a number would be executed. But don't forget something. These are only going to be trials of war crimes by Germans or Japanese for the most part. The winners decide what war crimes are. Remember Hamburg? So that's Yalta. Yalta happened in February. Now, don't forget that the Battle of the Bulge had just happened. And we really weren't sure, we as of the United States and Britain and the Soviets, how long the Germans will last. Maybe the world might not end by summer. It might go into fall. The Japanese might fight till 46. We gotta get this thing done. From February to May, the whole world would change in so many ways. Oh, one more thing I should add. Stalin demanded reparations, $20 billion, which was seen as lowballing it for the destruction that Germany did to the Soviet Union. Now, the Western allies were reluctant because they remember how the reparations after Versailles so angered the German people and would be part of the logic to Hitler. But Stalin is like, I don't care. I don't care what suffering Germany has. Look what happened to my country, and that's why I brought them to Yalta. Now, this will become important. This will become key because Hitler, Stalin's greatest fear, his greatest fear, and this is saying a lot because he's the most paranoid man ever to live, and I'm not exaggerating, his greatest fear was that Germany will do it again. But to many conservative foreign policy wise and rabid anti-communist they thought they were appeasing stalin giving too much by giving stalin a free end in eastern europe and by promising him reparations at an occupation zone they're giving too much and so here is a cartoon of okay first off it's implying we're putting europe together but now it's stalin taking everything from britain and the united states and to many conservatives, Yalta would become like the Munich Conference before the war. And this would be said time after time. In fact, it became almost doctrine in the United States, a myth, but people believed it, that Yalta, Roosevelt was outmaneuvered. Not really. When it first happened, Roosevelt was very pleased. Churchill was a little bit worried, but he was more worried about the British Empire surviving. What could the United States do? The Soviet Union had the strongest army in the world. Yes, they knew Stalin was untrustworthy, but they knew this. And don't forget, they, des they were desperate for Soviet help against Japan. Four months later, not so desperate. Do we really want Soviet occupation of Japan when we already have promised them half of Germany? The United States wants out. So just a couple months after this, Roosevelt died, just as American forces are crossing the Rhine River. Just when the war is about over, Roosevelt died, had a brain aneurysm, passed away quite shockingly fast. And nobody is more surprised by this. Um, that's one of the more famous pictures of a, a soldier uh, playing the um, accordion while uh, at Roosevelt's funeral. Harry Truman, the new president. And Truman was totally unprepared. In fact, it would be the day he, after he was, an, was uh, sworn in as the new president that he found out about the Manhattan Project, the making of the atomic bomb. He had hardly met at all Roosevelt. In fact, he was out of the loop at Yalta, which was a terrible mistake. He should have went, or at least been more in touch with it. In fact, he was playing poker in the Senate office buildings when he found out. Now, Roosevelt would have a burst of popularity, but you're going to get a lot of, who's Truman? Who is this lightweight, this absolutely unknown, relatively modest man from Missouri? And that's when he found out about the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project with this massive program, two million in direct costs and another two, two billion, I'm sorry, two billion in direct and two billion in indirect costs to build well, they weren't really sure exactly what they were going to build, but it was a, it would turn out to be a massive airdroppable bomb. And 
General Leslie Groves right here, he was the engineer in charge of building the Pentagon. And then J. Robert Oppenheimer was a scientific head at, at Los Alamos that would make the bomb. And this was a top secret operation. I love this picture outside of Los Alamos. If you can't read it, it says, what you see here, what you do here, what you hear here, when you leave here, let it stay here. A lot of here's there, but it has the famous monkey of hear no evil, see no evil, say no evil. And this massive program, the, all these dots represent huge programs. And it also tied in with the New Deal. The first uh, chain reaction would be at the University of Chicago, actually by Enrique Fermi, who was an Italian physicist who fled fascism. Many of the scientists fled fascism and Nazism and got to the United States. Remember what I told you, Nazism was relatively anti-science. At Oak Ridge in Tennessee, that is where they had massive centrifuges that would separate uranium. And why in Tennessee? Remember the Tennessee Valley Authority and all that hydroelectric power? And um, the first nuclear reactor to make plutonium, a man-made a man -made element, would be in Hanford, Washington, the Tri-City region. Why? Because it's right next to Grand Coulee Dam and other dams on the Columbia, electricity. And then Los Alamos, a relatively remote place, beautiful area in the high desert plateau of New Mexico. And the first atomic bomb explosion would be Trinity, the Trinity bomb. So while Trinity is, I mean, literally they're making the bomb. Now, as it turned out, the bomb was not ready to drop on Japan. But in July, 1945, another meeting of the big three happened outside of Berlin now at Potsdam. At a hotel, you can go visit there. It's a, it's a great place to go if you get a chance. But at Potsdam, the big three. And here's Roosevelt. Oh, I'm sorry. Not Roosevelt. Sorry. Tru uh, here's Truman and his main advisor, Jim, James Burns, going through the ruins of Berlin on the way to the conference to see the hell that had happened there. And the big three met. And, of course, Stalin was late. And you could imagine how he came in as the conquering hero, the absolute conquering hero. And Churchill is there, but actually they're having a parliamentary election during Potsdam. And during the election, think how Stalin felt. Well, I'm back, let me backtrack a little bit. Stalin came in as the conquering hero. Truman, he's thinking like, who's Truman? FDR was a giant. Truman, a lightweight. And then... The first election since the war began happened in Britain for Parliament. And Churchill's conservatives lost, and the labor leader, Clement Attlee, won. And so, literally, Churchill was there, went back to London for the night of the election, and Clement Attlee came back as prime minister. Now, he was part of Churchill's cabinet. He was very much involved in the government and the ruling of it. But Attlee would become it. Attlee's actually really famous. He's one of the most popular prime ministers in Brit British history. Why? Because after the war, and you can imagine how British are like, we've got to do something better for our people. He would be the prime minister who would be uh, like <laughs> ushering through the Labour Party's idea of a national health service in Britain, the most beloved thing in Britain now. But back to this thing. And they decided, on, okay, we'll all administer Germany together and then someday come together to reunify Germany. Someday. And they issued the Potsdam Declaration, but Stalin is still technically neutral. Japan does not know yet that Stalin is about ready to break that neutrality. And Japan to unconditionally surrender or face prompt and utter destruction. Now, there were a few things that added to it that implied maybe conditions, but this was issued by the British in the United States. Stalin, is, you know, he wants his invasion to be a total surprise. Just a sec. The mailman is here. And so, you could argue this agreement was, in many ways, the beginning of the Cold War. Because two big things happened here. The first thing, 
Stalin said, you know that uh, whole thing about free elections in Eastern Europe, you know, Poland especially, you know that whole thing? Uh, no, we're not going to have free elections. I will not allow governments there that will not be 100% ally to Stalin. He wanted a buffer zone between the Soviet Union and China, or, uh, and the Soviet Union and Germany. And so those elections not going to happen. And the big thing, remember Poland. Next, the Western allies, especially looking at the destruction of Germany, said no reparations. You can't squeeze blood from a stone. No reparations. But to Stalin, this was a major slap in the face. And so here's Stalin saying, I'm not going to do free elections. And to many on the West, like Churchill and, and Truman, this seemed like Stalin doing a major land grab. And then to Stalin, you're not allowing us reparations. So over 20 million Soviets died to defeat Germany. And now you're going to let us starve and suffer and don't help us anymore? They did promise to continue Lend-Lease. But one more thing before I get to Trinity. Right here, this was still up in Berlin, the Soviets hastily put up Ch Churchill, Roosevelt, and Truman. Or, am I doing it again? And Stalin. <laughs> Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin. And here, this right here, they literally had just taken down a picture of Roosevelt and put up a picture of Truman. Because they were still had it all planned on Roosevelt being there and the way the bureaucracy worked in the Soviet Union. It took them a long time to set that up. So this is happening in Berlin. Part of the 2nd U.S. Armored Division was sent to Berlin as the first U.S. troops to arrive in Berlin and to take over that occupation zone. The British sent one, the French sent one. Because remember, the Soviets took that city. And Berlin is destroyed. And of these units, just to let you know, Mr. Long, Matt, um, a lot of you that had him, um, uh, Mr. Long upstairs, he's, he's in the rarefied air of the math department upstairs. But Mr. Long's father was one of those men of the 2nd Armored Division to be the first American soldiers there. And he was in Berlin when the, the Potsdam Conference began. Oh, here's Atlee right here. Atlee. Truman, though, heard something at Potsdam. Trinity. Truman got word. In fact, the word was the baby was born. And the baby, the first successful atomic bomb explosion, Trinity. And he was overjoyed. Overjoyed. Now I have a bomb that not only might end the war in the Pacific quicker than the Soviets could get in, he also had a bomb that would impress Stalin. Stalin strutted around Potsdam like he ran the place. And Truman was furious at this. To Truman, he hated Stalin. He hated that Stalin uh, acted like the victor, that Stalin treated Truman like he was a second-class partner, and he wanted something to impress Stalin. But also, Truman is thinking, Stalin and his evil government has taken over much of Eastern or Central Europe, and who knows where we'll stop. We have got to have something in place that will tell Stalin that the United States will not accept them to take any more land. The United States will not allow him to take any more of Europe. How do we impress him? The atomic bomb. So he went up to Stalin, almost gleeful, and said, I have a bomb. He's kind of, yeah, he's really excited. I have a bomb that can destroy an entire city. And Stalin, puffing on his pipe, just looked at him and said, that's good. I hope you use it. I hope you use it? Truman was so disappointed. He wanted Stalin to say, one bomb will destroy the city. Oh, you are so strong. And instead, Stalin just puffed on his pipe and said, oh, that's good. Truman was so mad. And he was like, I'll show you. I have this bomb and I'm not afraid to use it. I'm not afraid to use it, even on a country that is basically defeated, Japan. One more thing I should add, why was Stalin so nonchalant? He was worried about the bomb. Why was he nonchalant? He already knew. There were spies, Soviet spies at Los Alamos who 
we're already in the process of sending the designs for the Trinity bomb to the Soviet Union. And so one more thing I have to add about this. When the Soviets took Berlin, the first thing they built was not rebuilding the city. They built a massive monument to the Soviet army right in the shadow of the Reichstag. So this picture, which is a picture of the poster at the monument, the gate outside of it, here's the, the shell of the Reichstag, and here's this big monument with a Soviet soldier on top. They built it. So when Potsdam happened, this monument to the Soviet army is there. It took them just a month to build, less than a month to build. It's a huge monument. And this is supposedly one of the first two Soviet T-34 tanks that entered uh, Berlin. And it's in the British occupation zone. They built it in the British occupation zone. So when they pulled out, the Western Allies will forever have this monument. <laughs> Look what the Soviets did. Don't mess with us. And now it's run by the German government. It's kept immaculately. And so this is my picture of it. Very artsy. You notice that? See, with this guy right behind here. Pretty impressive, huh? Yeah, I get that whole perspective thing going. So, while that's going on, the last two things for today. The United States did begin strategic bombing. They did begin it. They began to bomb the Japanese mainland at the end of 45 from the Marianas, from Saipan, Guam, and Tinian. And they're using this incredible $4 billion military program building this plane called the B-29 Super Fortress. The thought was it could fly 30,000 fleet at a pressurized cabin. It could carry anywhere from 10, well, up to 30,000 pounds of bombs. It had 12 machine guns and cannons to defend it from enemy aircraft, but they thought it would fly over Japanese air defenses. They thought it was so accurate it could precisionly bomb Japanese targets and drive Japan out of the war so they wouldn't have to invade the homeland. Well, they were doing this against Germany, and they didn't realize how relatively ineffective it was against Germany, but the B-29 attack on Japan was a disastrous failure. <coughs> One, a couple things, the Japanese could get that high. Here's a B-29 bomber hit at over 29,000 feet. Also, the Japanese, uh, or the B-29s couldn't hit the targets. They thought they could hit them relatively precision, or with, with relative precision, precision, less than 0.5% of the bombs hit within 500 yards of the target. They weren't even getting close. And a lot of planes had to turn back. When they were flying from the Marianas to Japan, planes were running into this 100 to 130 mile per hour headwind at 20 to 30,000 feet. And sometimes the wind would be so strong that they would run out of fuel and have to turn back. And they had no idea why this headwind, they knew there were really strong winds in the upper atmosphere, but this sometimes it'd be this constant wind that would blow kind of south, uh, southeast. Now, sometimes it would move and go different directions. The bombing campaign was a disastrous failure and they spent so much into this. Well, here's the Marianas. This is where they tried to bomb and it was not working at all. What did they discover? The jet stream. They had no idea about the jet stream. And yes, the jet stream moves back and forth depending on the climate, but it seems to hit this, you can see it right here over Japan, this southeast pattern here. Now, we probably heard about the jet stream. You see it whenever you, if you watch the weather on the news. But they had no idea. The Japanese knew about it. The Japanese knew about it partially because being an island nation and fearful of typhoons, they were more worried about the weather and seeing the weather patterns. The Americans would discover this. And this would dramatically affected the bombing. But I should add one more thing. The Japanese were already using the jet stream. They knew that the prevailing winds went all the way to the United States. And so beginning in 1944, the, U the Japanese started using balloon bombs, big helium balloons that would carry incendiary or fire bombs. And the thought was they'd be carried with the jet stream and they would try to time it, figure they would catch these very strong winds and 
And when they got over the American main lab, an automatic mechanism set to a timer would begin to, um, would begin to release air from this, from the, uh, from the balloon, and it would crash in the forests of the American Pacific Northwest. And then the thought was it would create a forest fire. The Americans would be forced to pull troops back from the Pacific and fight the fires. Now, no, it's not going to bring enough to end the war, but they were thinking, just bring the war to the, the American public, add discomfort, negotiated peace. This also should give you an idea about a combination of, of desperation, but also uh, <laughs> ingenuity. All these red dots are places where these balloons hit. Notice how many hit in Montana. My wife's grandfather found one near Phillipsburg. And... Look how many hit around here. It's actually remarkable. So right about here is one. These balloon bombs. No, they did not end the war, but they're actually remarkable things, and there's a picture of one. Now, of course, as I say this every time, this took a little bit longer than I wanted, so I will finish the rest of this tomorrow. I am changing the directions. I've decided to, to give you a totally new DBQ, and that's why I haven't turned it in. I'm going to take off uh, four of the documents. I'm only going to get, or five, three of the documents, I'm only going to give you five. And you have to pick four of them. I'm changing the, the rules, the rules, the directions to fit more of the DBQ you have to do in a couple, in two and a half weeks. And we'll talk more about it. I hope you're working on that review packet. Like I told you, 400 points. This DBQ will be worth 200. And I'll give you some more special directions tomorrow, but my hint on the directions is this. If you are not done with the DBQ by next Monday, the best you can get is a 90%. I'm just telling you, I want it done. All right, on this happy note, I am done. I hope uh, everything worked. I will see you tomorrow.